stop. Allumage moteur Vulcan. Allumage confirmé. Allo. Dutchovane. Salut. Servus. Allo. Hallo. 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 Hello, welcome to the Exploratorium. I'm Paul Doherty, senior scientist at the Exploratorium and a planetary physicist. And I'm here to tell you what we've been finding out about comet churyumov gerasimenko from the Rosetta spacecraft. So the Rosetta is the first spacecraft to rendezvous with a comet and send a lander down to land on the comet. Okay, it was a crash landing, but we did land on the comet and the uh, Philae lander is still there. So it's a comet. In the last few months, it has become closer to the sun, and it's warming up, and it's really spewing uh, gas and dust into space. And this is one of the more recent pictures. And it points out to you that just like the Earth or the moon, there's a day side and a night side. The, planet, the comet is rotating. I'm going to pass around to you a model of the comet. I drilled a hole in it and stuck a rotation axis in it. And the interesting thing is that like the Earth, it has an Arctic. And we'll learn a little bit about the Arctic of the comet. It's cold enough already, but the Arctic on the comet is really something. But it's springtime in the Arctic. And that's going to lead to some really interesting things on this comet. So the comet goes around every six and a half or so years, 6.4 years. And it goes way on this picture. The salmon colored orbit is Mars and the blue colored orbit is Earth. And you can see that when it gets closest to the sun, the comet swings in between Earth and Mars. It, gets, it doesn't get closer than the Earth does to the sun. And it swings way out, far away from the sun. And it only takes six and a half years to go around this orbit. And we sent out Rosetta and rendezvoused with the comet in August 2014. So the comet has been falling towards the sun with its companion Rosetta since then. To give you some details about the comet, this is how big it is. It's, it's about four kilometers, three miles, the longest axis. This is LA. If you've come from San Francisco, you might be glad that I chose LA for this picture rather than San Francisco. But it's, you, this, however, this comet is, um, maybe a quarter or an eight, quarter to an eighth volume of the comet that hit the Earth and destroyed the dinosaurs. So that, that particular impactor was about 10 miles across and it dug a 100 mile hole. Uh, just the same, this might not be enough to wipe out every bit of life on Earth, but we don't want it to hit us. Um, it's cold on the comet. When it was out in space, it's, it's now coming in closer towards, towards Earth. But here I am standing on the rim of an erupting volcano in Antarctica. And in this picture, it's minus 30 Celsius. It's pretty cold. My cameraman took off his face mask and in a minute had frostbite. Um, but on the comet, it's, more, it's colder than that. So the temperatures are running right now minus 68 Celsius to minus 43 Celsius. You can find those temperatures on Earth. Um, but you don't want to. The comet itself is black. Uh, the moon is actually quite dark itself. You look at the moon, you don't realize it's really dark, but it's against the really blackness of space and it's in full sunlight, so it looks bright. And so the comet, especially when they expose it for camera pictures, looks bright, but it's really as dark as an asphalt highway. Um, now I'm gonna tell you some things about the comet that I figured out. And as I said, I have the same superpower that Tony Stark does. He's got an MIT ring, I've got an MIT ring, so I can do the calculations. So here are the numbers on the comet, okay? You can see the different sizes here. It's four kilometers across one way and four kilometers the other, shaped like a duck. Come on, who expected that? No one expected that. It um, rotates once every 12.4043 hours. We'll learn more about that. It's got a spin axis, uh, it's very cold surface temperatures, and we're beginning to find out that in, in June of 2014, it was giving off like a third of a liter uh, per second of water, and in August of 2014, it was up to 1.2 liters per second, and now it's really getting up there. It's really blasting water out into space. So think of it as the classic dirty snowball. And since we know 
that how much it weighs, three billion tons, and we know its volume, we can find its density. And the density of this comet is about half the density of ice. It's about 470 kilograms per meter cubed. That's about the density of the cork you put in your wine bottle. Uh, or it's fluffy snow. So our, our, this is definitely a fluffy comet. Um, thanks to Isaac Newton, I can calculate what the acceleration of gravity is on this comet. And um, plugging in the mass and the radius and all those things, I find out that if you fall on this comet, you fall with 300 thousandths of the acceleration at the surface of the Earth. What does this mean? It means if you, if you step up on one of these chairs and step off, it takes you 1.3 minutes to hit the comet. So the acceleration is really slow. So when they drop the Philae lander from 10 kilometers, it took seven hours for it to fall. They, they just dropped it in free fall and the gravity of the comet pull it down. And uh, so it, it took seven hours, even without air resistance. Just to give you an idea what that means, Muhammad Ali on the Earth weighs what Muhammad Ali wears, weighs. On the comet, he'd weigh as much as a butterfly. So it gives you the idea the gravity here is not so big. One of the nice things about gravity is it has escape velocity. And the escape velocity you can calculate, and it's about half a meter per second or one mile an hour. And that means that if I jump with enough energy to bring me one centimeter above the surface of the Earth, that would launch me from this comet forever and I'd never come back. That means it's hard to remain on the surface of the comet. One little misstep and you're gone away and you never come back. So um, landing something on this comet is going to be a bit of a problem as it was. Um, we're orbiting it. For a while there we orbited it. We got close enough and slow enough and the, orb the time it takes to go around the comet in one orbit at 30 kilometers, about 20 miles above the surface, was a, a 23 days. So here you are, 20 miles above the surface, it's going to take two-thirds of a month to go around once. And we did that with the Rosetta for a while. All right, so now I've given you the intro. Now let's see what we found out. It's a comet. It's turned on. Comets have tails. This comet is now spouting dust and gas into space and at quite a rate. And you can see it here in, in this photo, um, some of the the tails coming out of the comet, blasted away. Um, here's one here. If you overexpose the image here and you look over in the, in the right-hand photo, this is the same photo, this is overexposed. These straight lines coming out here, that's a jet of gas and dust blasting out of this crater. And we're beginning to map the origins of the dust plumes coming out. Here's one they were watching they were, they were taking pictures, they watched, and they saw one turn on. So here it is, there was nothing there. The very next second, bang, there's a jet coming out of it. This is a puzzle. It's coming out of the dark. It's not warm there. What's a jet, which is usually caused by the warming up of the ices of the comet, what's it doing coming out of the middle of the dark side? You see, there are puzzles here, even for Tony Stark and even for me. I don't know why it came out of the dark side, but that's the kind of thing we hope to find. We're going to be falling around the sun with this comet when it comes closest to the sun in August. It's really going to be warmer then, and interesting things will be happening, and hopefully the spacecraft will be there watching how the comet comes to life. Well, on the comet, there is several one centimeter squared plates. This is one centimeter squared, big as the thumbnail, okay? And these are particles that the Rosetta spacecraft is sweeping out of space. These are the particles that came from the comet. They give big ones names. And they have, there are now um, 12,000 particles they've picked up and they're studying. And they find they come in two categories. There are dense grains, just like you, maybe a, a grain of sand from a beach in San Francisco. And there are fluffy balls of dust, the same density as a dandelion seed. 
And so, and so we have those, we've captured them, and they'll be studying them to find their compositions and find out in that dirty snowball, what is the dirt? Those, those, those dense grains, I'm betting they're silicates, they're like rocks. And the fluffy ones, I don't know what those are. Those are really interesting. So we have lots to learn. Um, the comet rotates, um, well, every 12.4 hours. That means the comet is rotating at the speed of the hour hand of a clock. So when an hour hand goes around once, the comet's gone around just about once. And, oh, it's, it's uh, 10 to the 13th kilograms. Um, okay, so the comet rotates. So I'm going to pass these two around. You can sort of get, get the feel for the comet, pass this around. And this one, this one, I drilled through the polar axis. Look at this thing. It's shaped like a duck. And yet, that's the axis it rotates around. Okay? That means, it goes this way, actually. That means that is the North Pole. You know, on a sphere like the Earth, the, the North Pole's like at the top, right? This North Pole is down in the valley. And the South Pole down here, this model is quite smooth on this side. And that's because we've never seen it. It's always been in the dark. Just like on Earth, the South Pole is in the dark for six months of the year. The South Pole of the comet is in the dark for a long period of time. In fact, in the elliptical orbit of this comet, the South Pole is in the dark for just about six years. And then, as it races around the sun, so, so um, if, if I'm the sun, here it is, spinning about its axis, the far side is always in the dark. It races, it keeps that axis the same. I'm the sun, now I'm shining on what was the dark side. It's about to be springtime on the south pole of this comet. And it's gonna heat up, and we expect that when it heats up, it's going to lose 20 meters of ice and dust. It's been around every 6.4 years for who knows how long. Every time it comes around, it loses 20 meters, 20 meters, 20 meters. And it's, ten, it's uh, you know, four kilometers across. It still has a lot more to go. But it's going to be really interesting to watch this comet lose such a great amount of mass. We're going to learn a lot from that. But it's, this is, we use this with uh, students in high school. They, they're just so Earth-centric. They, they barely grasp the seasons on the Earth. And uh, now you have to try to grasp the seasons on a weird duck rotating about a strange axis. The, the equator, by the way, goes around like this. So that, as it rotates around, of course, the, the equator sort of goes a figure eight shaped around this comet. So I'll start this one on this side and you can spin it. Okay, back. I, I will take questions at the end. So here are some pictures snapped by the spacecraft as the comet rotates. So here it is. Picture one, two, three. That's the butt. <laughs> That's the duck butt. Okay. And here's a little animation of the rotating comet. And where all the lines come together there is the North Pole. That's where I drilled the hole. And some of the other lines here, those are the lines of latitude and longitude on this comet. And here it is spinning around. Don't worry about the thing on the right. <laughs> nice stately rotation, hour hand of a clock. So it has a pole star. We have Polaris. The axis of this comet the, is pointing towards Alpha Camilla Pardis, the giraffe constellation. You might notice some constellations you recognize in this photo. We've got the big bear. We've got the little bear or the little dipper. This, by the way, here is the big dipper. That is Polaris. That's the Earth's pole star. The comet pole star is over here. So it's interesting to think of other planets and other objects having pole stars. At least it has one. And here it is. Winter is coming. Um, it's summer for 5.6 years on the northern hemisphere. 
and then winter for 10 months when it's near the sun. Now the side in darkness is moving into its summer for 10 months. Um, this is a map of how much surface is going to be lost. The red map here, which is in the dark right now, is going to lose 20 meters. The blue part, which has been in the sun for, for you know, six years, it's not going to lose much at all. We don't think. This is our prediction. The comet gets to tell us whether we're right or wrong. That's the essence of science. Do the experiment. Well, we've been orbiting this comet and we've made geologic maps of the comet. Each one of these different color areas has enough differences to its appearance that we think they're somehow different. And so we are making a geologic map of this really strange body. And all of these names are taken from ancient Egypt. That's the essence of this comet. Uh, so now let me show you some of the geology of the comet. As we look into the region here, we call the neck, this narrow part here, which we call the neck. Notice these striations. This is a gigantic cliff, a gigantic cliff. We think it's ice coated with dust. It means, and the gravity here is so low. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a mountain climber. If I can get my ice tools here, I'm willing to climb that because if I fall off, I hit the surface after falling a kilometer, I only hit the surface at one mile an hour. It's no problemo. Uh, but look at these lines here, the lineations, and look at the loose boulders that probably have fallen off the cliff and, and accumulated here on the neck. Um, the neck has a big crack in it. We don't know what that means. Are there comet quakes? Is this comet going to split in half? Is it coming or going? <laughs> we don't know. Um, I'm going to show you three pictures in a row. Here's the locators. Right up here on this face, there's a feature here I'm going to show you first. And then over here is a skyline picture. And then down here is a smoother area near the neck. So here's the feature that the geologists are calling the fist. You can see the knuckles. And this is an indication that there's some layering here that is opened up. So there's some tectonic layering in this comet. And here's a skyline picture. Sky with stars behind and then the edge of the comet. And you see, humans are really good at seeing lines, but I see lines in that picture. What causes them? We have to find out. Here's again, this is an area with some smooth stuff. But here is one of the real puzzles that has scientists scratching their heads. Those look like sand dunes. Sand dunes? It's in a vacuum. Where is the wind that blows to make the sand dunes? It's not the solar wind is far too weak to blow the dust grains. That is a real puzzle. What are the forces that have shaped these sand dune looking things? on the surface of the comet. Puzzles. Um, the cliffs do erode. They do collapse. There is this, even under this low gravity, here's a cliff that's collapsed into a pile of rubble and another one and another one. These happen in California too. We have our slumps and our landslides. They have slides on comets. This is 100 meters. That's the 100 meter dash right there. Um, here's another one. When you have an avalanche, like this place avalanched here, the bright patches, it shows up as bright white underneath. That's a symptom of ice. It's like there's a dust layer on the surface. And there's also some brightness here, which may be ice uh, at sea in the image. Um, here's another avalanche. In this picture, there's a cliff on the lower left, uh, on the middle left with debris underneath and in the top center and top right there's some more avalanches. And here another set of avalanches. So with the weak gravity it has, the gravity might be weak but what this comet's made of is weaker especially when the ice that it's made of turns to gas and goes away. Um, the crater looking things on this comet are strange by crater standards. Many of them, like this one right here, the ring in the center of this photo, have very thin rims. 
just really, really thin. Look at the beautiful shadows of those thin rims. As a mountain climber, I'd really love to scamper along that rim. It'd be narrow underfoot with great falls on either side I didn't have to fear. But this leads to some very interesting cratering. In this picture at the bottom right, there's another thin rimmed crater. And in this one here, several, find them at the top center, several rimmed craters, one of them closer to the center, in fact, two or three or four, seem to be filled with something. What would fill the craters? Dust or some sort of uh, material? We have, a, we have a lot to watch and learn on this comet. Uh, again, some of it's what we call competent rock, some of it's rock that haven't avalanched, but there's some nice bright white stuff revealed probably as ice on the left of the cliff. Striations and lines appear in the bedrock of this comet. The bedrock, of course, is probably made from the mineral H2O, water ice, and uh, just lots of boulders everywhere. So when they went to land on the comet, they couldn't land in these boulder-strewn places. They had to look for a big, flat, smooth place like this. Nice, smooth place for them to land on. Uh, now, while they were looking, they found some even stranger uh, pictures. Here is a pit, and this is 40 meters across, and this pit is completely lined on the inside with little balls about a meter across. Okay? They call them dragon's eggs because we don't know what they're made of. One hypothesis is that maybe the comet was originally assembled from ice balls that were a meter in size that sort of came together and stuck together in space. We don't know. The wonderful, amazing things we don't know about how comets are made. We're studying this comet to figure it out. Um, here's a, some close-ups of the sand dune-like ripples. And these boulders have things that look like dust tails downstream of some sort of flow. Those of you that live in a snowy environment know that things that stick out of the snow and the wind have tails behind them. And we're sh they're showing up on the comet. We don't know what the equivalent of the wind is that makes them. And here's another pit, and it really looks like comet vomit coming out of it. It's down straight down from this. That looks like a liquid flow. This is all in a hard vacuum. Liquids do not do well in a hard vacuum. What could make something that looks like a liquid flow? And one of the things you can think of, it's, it's, it's when gas gets mixed in with dust, you have something called a fluidized bed. It's like quicksand, but instead of water, it's air. The air inflates this dust, and it flows like a liquid, and then it farts out the dust as it collapses under gravity, leaving something behind. You can see this in Southern California, where giant landslides flowed down, entrapping air underneath them that made them flow like a fluid, even though they were made of rock, until the air farted out and made a big rim around the outside. So we see something like this on Earth. We don't know what this is. I just gave you one hypothesis. Um, and these, these linear striations on the, on the left of this picture, there you see some straight lines, fractures perhaps. We don't know. And on the right, lowlands full of flat, dusty stuff. So that's the essence of the comet. And to go find out the answers to some of those questions, the Rosetta spacecraft, oops, sorry, the Rosetta spacecraft um, carried a lander named Philae, and you can see it here nestled into the back of Rosetta. And what it did, how do you land on a comet? Here it is landing on the comet. And when it landed, it was supposed to fire a little rocket motor on the top to push it down. It had two harpoons it was going to fire into the surface. And after the legs hit, it was going to screw itself into the surface. All three failed. Triple failure. We'll find out what happened to Rosetta in a minute. Here was the plan. You're going to kiss the comet with Philae the lander. So here it comes in. They, they just s throw it out the back at the same speed that the spacecraft is going forward. So it stopped. It's not in orbit anymore. So it falls for seven hours. And they have a little gyroscope inside of it to keep it stable so it's going to land on its legs. 
So it deploys its legs. Down it goes, accelerating slowly for seven hours. It hits two harpoons fire. The legs screw themselves into the surface. There it is, anchored on the surface. Didn't happen. So here's where they were going to land, a landing site called Aglikia. Smooth, they picked a smoothest place. Um, here it is, close up, nice and smooth. Few boulders, it could have died on the boulders. They dropped it from 30 kilometers up, 20 miles up, and um, they, they hit at about a one meter a second. They hit at about two miles an hour. And that's about, and it weighs about 200, that has a mass of, of an equivalent to a 220 pound guy. So it'd be like a 220 pound guy hitting you at two miles an hour, not bad. And this is the orbit that they did to drop it. <laughs> they zipped around and they dropped it and then they got out of there. Um, and as spacecraft do, they took a picture of their baby as it left. Here's our baby falling towards the surface of the comet. And here's the picture from the baby. Here it is falling towards Aglikia. And here it is getting closer. And then the mother craft took pictures of it as it bounced. It starts at the lower left. And in the inset image on the lower left, that is a picture from Rosetta of the lander as it hit first. That's its first hit really close to where it was supposed to hit. And then it bounced because none of the anchors worked. It bounced up for over an, and, and, and so it hit at 1514. And then it got a picture at 1519 and 1523. The next two pictures, that's it mid bounce. And finally at 1543, about half an hour later, it hit the edge of the, of the uh, landings. It, it hit the edge of the, a crater. And in fact, in the close-ups here at the middle, there are three dents here. This is before it hit. This is after. Those are the impacts from the three legs as it hit the surface and bounced again. And from there, it, it would bounce like this. It went up and then it changed angle and it bounced over here. And here they got the picture of it as it disappeared into the shadow to be lost. So that's what we know about this. And because it had a magnetometer on it, the magnet recording allowed us to get a real nice picture of the bounces. So on the bottom here, it shows it came down in the dashed line, bounced off the surface, hit the edge of a crater, bounced even higher. It was coming in fast and collided and bounced up higher and then went into the dark. And we've been looking for it ever since. So it, here it is. This is a picture it took when it landed in the ditch somewhere. It had a few hours of power in its batteries. And so it, the little picture of itself, a little part of itself, and the rock cliff it ended up against. And here's the picture from all of its cameras. It's on its side, absolutely on its side. So the upper left camera is supposed to be looking at the ground if it were right side up. It's looking out in space. And the other cameras are looking at the rock around it. So we got these pictures back. We did some samples. It ran out of energy. It's sitting there. We think it's in that shadow. Well, we wanted to go in close to get a picture of Philae. We wanted to find out where it was. So they, even though the comet was spewing out water and dust, they decided they'd risk the spacecraft to fly in close. They flew so close that the smudge in the bottom of this picture is the shadow of Rosetta. It's a shadow selfie. And they went really close in. And as they went in, they made magnetic field measurements. And the top one is the magnetic field measured from Rosetta. And the bottom one is the magnetic field measured at the same time by Philae. They mirror each other pretty much together at the two nano Tesla level. There's no magnetic field on this comet. The Earth's magnetic field is 50,000 Teslas. The magnetic field of this comet is two or less. And so we discovered you can't use a magnetic compass on this, on this comet. What really happened to Phil A? Um, well, here's what Star Wars said. Um, I don't think so, but well. Um, but the beastie, the comet, which is a comet, 
almost killed Rosetta last month. As they flew in to get pictures of their baby, all this dust coming out confused the star. So it, it turns out that Rosetta stabilizes itself. You see the red things here? Those red things, the tiny little red things in the middle of the back of Rosetta, they're star trackers. They're looking up at the stars to find out, and they, they're pattern recognition. They, they look at the stars, they know which way they're pointed, and they use their gyroscopes and gas jets to keep it oriented in space. When they flew close to the comet, there were so many bright dust grains around it, it got confused. It lost its ability to track the stars. It lost its pointing. It drifted. The bottom right corner there is a part of a giant antenna that talks to Earth, a small antenna that talks to Earth. It drifted off. They lost contact. The spacecraft said, I can't talk to mom. I don't know where I am. It shut itself down into safe mode. But luckily, they planned the approach this way. It came in from a distance on the upper of the two parallel paths. It then went into a powered orbit, or it came in this way, went into a powered orbit around to see, but eventually was planned on exiting. So even though it went into its shutdown phase, it was already in its exit orbit by the time that happened. And by the time they got out of the dust and out into the clear sky again and it could pick up the stars and recover, they were already 200 kilometers away from the comet and drifting further. And they actually, in trying to get it back, they ha it went into safe mode again and they ended up 400 kilometers from the comet. And so for the last month, they've been working their way slowly back in and I think that they will not risk the mission again by trying to get close to see where Philae is. They're gonna stay away, watch this comet bloom and go around the sun and learn the answers to some of those mysteries that I gave you. I can't give you answers. We don't know the answers. This is about science. It's about finding answers. So thank you for coming tonight. I'm going to stay along, stay with you after the recording is over and answer your questions. So thank you very much.